Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me through this? Okay. So good evening, welcome, and thank you for joining us for Fairfield Area's first Connections with the Community Forum. We are recording the session for those who are unable to join us in person this evening, and we will post the forum to our district website for student, staff, and community reference. My name is Tom Haupt, Superintendent, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this evening, Corporal Aaron Allen of the PA State Police. Corporal Allen is a law enforcement officer, professor, and consultant who values service and education and integrates both in his daily duties in order to improve relationships within his community. He graduated from Choan University in North Carolina with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Shortly after, he went on to earn his master's degree from Point Park University in criminal justice administration and management. A native of Greensburg, PA, Corporal Allen attended the Pennsylvania State Police Academy in 2015. Upon graduation, he worked in the patrol unit for approximately five years and has served since in numerous capacities within the PA State Police, including de-escalation instructor, diversity and inclusion instructor, alternate community service officer, and recruitment coordinator, to name a few. Mr. Allen was recently promoted to corporal and is currently serving as a Heritage Affairs Liaison Officer with the Pennsylvania State Police Office of Community Engagement. As a Heritage Affairs Liaison Officer, Corporal Allen works with local, state, and federal agencies where he investigates, oversees, and responds to hate crimes, bias-related incidents, and any incident that deals with racial tension throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The goal of the Pennsylvania State Police Heritage Affairs Office is to improve community relations and build positive relationships between law enforcement and the communities in which they serve. Corporal Allen, I'm excited to learn with you this evening, so please help me welcome Corporal Allen to Fairfield area. Corporal. Thank you, sir. Truly, truly appreciate it. How's everyone doing tonight? Okay. All right, so um, just before we get started, I really, really appreciate that introduction, but I'm going to uh, further introduce myself uh, before we get started. So again, my name is Corporal Aaron Allen. I'm with the Pennsylvania State Police Heritage Affairs Office. So what my office does, we respond, we investigate, we oversee any sort of hate crimes, bias-related incidents, or any acts of racial tension that happen throughout the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Some incidents that I've been heavily involved in and have responded to since day one has been the Tree of Life Synagogue massacre that happened right in my backyard in the Pittsburgh area, the East Pittsburgh shooting with Antoine Rose Jr., where a 15-year-old juvenile boy ran from police uh, from a vehicle and subsequently was shot three times in the back uh, by a white police officer. I also overseen the Penn State University Man Campus incident where campus police responded to um, a mental health crisis for a student. The student was armed with a knife and subsequently the campus police officers shot and killed the student inside of his dorm room. I also overseen the Bedford County protest incident where a group of protesters were traveling from Milwaukee, Wisconsin down to Washington, D.C. They ended up stopping in Bedford County. Anyone know where Bed Bedford County is? All right. Individual stopped in front of a, a dwelling. Uh, the homeowner came out with a shotgun thinking that they were on uh, his property and subsequently fired one round into the air and then leveled it out, shooting into the protesters, shooting one of them in the face. And lastly, I overseen the Venango County campground shooting where, where a group of friends traveled to Venango County to a campground one of the individuals, which is an African-American male, ended up ingesting mushrooms, had a very, very bad reaction to them, ended up acting very erratic, and picking up an AK-47 that was at the campground. He then started waving it around. One of his friends feared for his life, ended up pulling out his firearm from his hip and shooting that individual and killing him. So 
I talk about those incidents before every time I speak because I want to kind of paint a picture of the incidents that our office responds to on a daily basis, and that's statewide. Our goal is to bridge the gap between law enforcement and the community. That's really our goal. I always say that we're firefighters. We put out fires for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania because we want to keep our law enforcement officers safe. We want to keep our community safe. But we all want, also want to tend to the community a significant amount, especially after an incident like those happen. As you could probably tell, a lot of those incidents stir up a lot of racial tension, civil tension, community tension. And we want to make sure that every entity within those incidents are taken care of. And we do that by bridging gaps, but also building relationships statewide. When those things aren't happening, I'm building relationships every single day by meeting with certain community leaders, state representatives, state senators. So with our goal is, God forbid those bad things happen again, we have a better grab on the community. We have a, gr a better understanding for what the needs may be. And we may reach out to those community leaders, community entities for help. Once again, with an all-around goal to bridge that, bridge that gap between law enforcement and the community. What I also do for the Pennsylvania State Police Heritage Affairs Office is we teach. We teach a large amount of trainings and curriculum, such as racial profiling awareness, implicit bias training, history of policing, de-escalation training, and we just implemented this training, which is the importance of understanding diversity, equity, inclusion, and biases. I actually made this training because I think that it's very important that we don't just focus on law enforcement all the time. This can be a training where teachers, um, airlines, uh, anybody can get this training, especially community members like yourselves. And hopefully we leave today with a little bit more of an understanding of why this is so important. Um, I've presented this at colleges, middle schools, high schools, everywhere. Because once again, this is a very, very big topic, and it's important for us all to learn together, right? It's important to learn and grow to make sure that we can better serve our communities, right? A little bit more about myself. I'm from Greensburg, Pennsylvania. I, sp I drove three hours here today to speak for an hour, then I'm going to drive right on back. Uh, but... Before we get started, I'm one of the most laid back, coolest dudes in the world, I promise you, okay? You're not gonna hurt my feelings. Um, you're, 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 I want to teach about this stuff because this is how we grow. We need to talk about the elephant in the room, especially in the era that we're in right now. Uh, so please, this is a very interactive training as well. You are, you are not gonna see me stand up here and click, 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 and it's gonna be death by PowerPoint. Uh, I need some feedback. I'm also a college professor, which you'll see today a little bit of how my teaching style, uh, but I think you'll like this training. So uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. I'm sorry I don't have a clicker up here. It does not work, but we're going to make sure we get it done. So a little disclaimer, and once again, this is an uncomfortable topic. All of those entities, diversity, equity, inclusion, biases, that's very, very uncomfortable for anyone to talk about, uh, especially in this type of setting, right? Uh, sometimes when I reach out to certain entities in the community, they don't want to talk about this stuff. They're like, please, don't come here, right? We don't want to talk about the elephant in the room, and it's a beautiful thing that you all want to, and I thank you for that. So uh, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. So a little bit about the course overview. We're going to have a bias exam. We're going to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion. We're going to talk about stereotypes. We're ultimately going to have a bias exam. We're going to talk about the brain and how it functions when it comes to biases, diversity, equity, inclusion. Then we're going to talk about overcoming these biases. So becoming a citizen of the world, talking about diversity, equity, inclusion. Experiencing people and practices that are different from your own helps you better communicate, interact with your coworkers, members, community members. It doesn't matter. Learning about others and their experiences will give you a new perspective and may help you change your mindset, right? It may help you think about it. Well, you know, I didn't think about it that way, right? And then embracing diversity is the first step in achieving true acceptance, and it helps us find 
things that we may have in common, or we may say, you know, we have nothing in common, which is a big thing within the Pennsylvania State Police Academy. We actually utilize that as a tactic. When you first get to the academy, we want to house people from the inner city of Philadelphia with people from Fairfield. Why would that be important for us getting our troopers out into the community and then getting them ready to embark on a new position within certain areas? Why would that be important? It's a culture shock. We want to put them into a culture shock on day one. We want to make sure that they appreciate people that may not be, look like them, talk like them, uh, interact like them. So that's very important to us. So can you imagine how it would be if everyone was just like you? Think about it. If everyone you dealt with on an everyday basis was just like you, how would that be? Give me some words of how that would be, sir. It would be awesome. I love it. I love it, right? It would be absolutely awesome, right? What else? Boring, okay, boring. Why would it be boring? I mean, that's part of society, everyone being different. You don't eat the same food There you go, right? So it would be absolutely boring. What do you eat every day? Okay, cereal, right? Could you imagine if you ate cereal every single day, right? That's boring as heck, right? What else? Well, how else would it be? We got boring, we got awesome. What else? Go ahead. It would be weird, right? Because just like we were talking earlier, right? You should appreciate all your friends and their differences, right? You guys learn from each other. Uh, and you guys kind of lean on each other for those, di those differences. And that's kind of what we do within our department, right? We have so many people from so many different walks of life. And we want to make sure we lean on those individuals and utilize their, their, their phenomenal resources, right? Uh, I do very well within the areas that I serve. I look like some of the people that I, that, that I, the areas that I go into, I talk like them, uh, and I kind of better relate to those individuals. If you put me maybe in Philadelphia in a Hispanic community, I don't know Spanish. <laughs> I'm not going to do very well. So we utilize and tap into those resources as best as we possibly can, and it's important that we are different no matter what and embrace that. So embracing diversity and inclusion is a smart thing to do from an organizational perspective because it positions you as a leader in a rapidly changing and diverse state. And you can all probably see that, right? We are changing every single day within our communities, uh, within our school districts, everywhere. And if we kind of embrace what we're talking about tonight, we're going to be in front of an eight ball, right? It's the people that sweep it under the rug and say, oh, we don't have a problem here. Or, hey, you know, we, we don't want to accept these differences where they're going to be behind the eight ball, okay? It's also the right thing to do because it creates an environment where people are fully included, valued, and valued for who they are and what they have to offer because that's all ultimately the acceptance part. We want to make sure that we accept everyone, right? We don't have to like that person, but we better be able to accept them, right? So I want you to think of your own definition of diversity. We're going to talk about the textbook one, and you all are going to hear that I hate the textbook version of diversity. Uh, but I want you to give me your own definition of diversity. Someone give me one. Someone think of one. My man, talk to me. I love it, right? He thinks diversity is the way that people are different. That's perfect, beautiful, I love it. Who else? Give me something else. Give me your own personal definition. Somebody other than my man back here, because he's paying it. There you go. Come on. Sure. Yeah, I love it. It's beautiful. I love it. I love it. That's your definition. That's, that's the right one, right? You don't want to know my definition of diversity? Well, when it was, well, when I first got called for this position, well, I'm a diversity and inclusion instructor for the state, right? And when they called me and asked me to take that position, I'm like, heck no. I'm not taking that position. I know why you're calling. And why do you think I turned it down initially? Why do you think I turned it down? 
Yeah, I'm like, you want to cho- pick the chosen black guy, right? Guy that looks decent in a suit, speaks fairly well, right? And I'm like, you're not using me for that. Because my definition of diversity was black and white. And when they sent me to training, when they sent me to school, diversity and inclusion school, you know, I started to see, you know, diversity is way more than color. It's absolutely way more. And it was my bias and my, you know, definition that I didn't understand that. So I could have literally passed up a phenomenal opportunity because of my bias or my own definition of diversity. So it's more than just black and white. And you'll see that here in a minute. So what does diversity mean to you? And I think we already answered that, right? It's so important to understand the diversity that we all have within any entity that we work in or go to school in or anything of that nature. So I want you to think of your own definition of inclusion. So someone give me your own definition of inclusion. I'll give you the textbook one here in a minute. We'll kind of blow past it because I hate it. But what is your own definition of inclusion? Think about it. Inclusion. You got it? Not this one? It's all right. Talk to me. Okay. I love it, right? People with different backgrounds, different experiences, all feel a part of the same thing. That's beautiful. I love it. Man. Everybody gets a seat at the decision-making table. I love it. Everyone gets a seat at the decision-making table. That's beautiful. My definition is inviting everyone to the party. You'll see this long, crazy definition of inclusion and diversity, but my definition of inclusion and how I teach it is literally inviting everyone to the party. Simple, okay? Simple. And then what are some examples of an inclusive environment? Give me some. Is today an example of inclusive environment? Absolutely. We've got all walks of life here. We're all accepted here. We're all here for the same goal, right? Talk to me. A party, right? I love it. Like a pizza party, right? At school, right? How about basketball practice? Yeah, absolutely. Football practice, all of that, right? It's beautiful. I love it. Next. So this is the textbook version that we talked about earlier. I can't stand it. Just look at it real quick, and then we'll move on. Next. Inclusion definition. Once again, if we just stick to Everyone invited to the party, I think we're better off with that definition than this textbook one, right? Next. So I love this, right? So this is what really changed my mind about my definition of diversity. So this is diversity will. You have race, work experience, sexual affection, orientation, national origin, ability, age, uh, religion, education, gender, identity, socioeconomical class, right? We have all these entities, ethnicity, all these entities that really show you how diverse a room can actually be. And when I teach diversity and inclusion for the state, you know, we have 60, 70 people in a room. And you really get to see a beautiful sense of what diversity is because we actually go around the room, which we're going to do here in a minute, real quick with a few of us, and we're going to introduce ourselves by utilizing two or more of these entities that are on the diversity wheel. And I'm telling you, even in a room full of white people, full of black people, Chinese people, it doesn't matter, right? You will see just how diverse a room can be because we all have different entities within this, right? Within the wheel. So I'll I'll start. So my name is Corporal Aaron Allen. I am an African-American male that holds a master's degree. Give me one. Introduce yourself. Good, love it. Ma'am. Uh, love it. I love it, brother. Good. There you go. Good. Good, sir. Go ahead now. There you go. I love it. Good. Last one. There you go. I love it, right? So just with those few people, you can see how diverse it is, right? 
I'm the only minority in regards to what we just talked about, right? But we're still diverse. It's not all about black and white, right? We have all of this experience in the room. And if we did that all the way to the back, we would have so much diversity in this room. So remember, it's not always about color. It's about these entities when you talk about diversity. Next. Next. All the way through, please. So stereotypes, and this is where we get a little bit uncomfortable when we talk about these entities, right? So stereotypes, uh, in social psychology, a stereotype is an overgeneralized belief about a particular category of people. Stereotypes are generalized because one assumes that a stereotype is true for each individual person in that category. While such generalizations may be useful when making quick decisions, they may be erroneous when applied to a particular individual. Stereotypes encourage prejudice and may rise for a number of reasons. Next. So this is where it gets uncomfortable, right? I want us to actually talk about stereotypes because that's the only way we get past them. And then that's the only way we fight them, right? So number one, what are some stereotypes that you've heard? Give me some. Who's going to break the ice? Trumpers. There we go. Trumpers are what? are white, racist, right? They, they hate uh, African-American males, right? They may be a part of uh, hate groups, right? When you think about Trumpers at times, that's a stereotype, right? Is that true? No, it's not, right? Absolutely not, right? There's good people to love Trump. That's okay, right? But that's a stereotype. Give me another one. Give me another one. Me how did you know? You took mine, yeah? <laughs> he saw this already. He took mine. So white man can't jump, right? Absolutely, right? I'm a basketball player, played high school, college, um, and that's a huge stereotype. I played with some white guys that can jump out the gym, right? So absolutely, that's a stereotype. What else? Give me another one. Old people are bad drivers, Old people are bad drivers right? Uh, we talk about my mom, right? She's definitely older and she's definitely a bad driver. So that's true for her. But for other people, absolutely not. Give me one. Oh, man, I love that, right? Just because you're popular means you're the best person, right? Definitely not true, okay? How about all black people love fried chicken? Right? We hear some chuckles. That's okay, right? That's a stereotype, okay? Um, and there's many, many more. But once again, most of them, you'll talk, we'll see in a minute, they're all negative, right? They're all negative. Okay. So how do we learn these stereotypes? How do we learn these? Who teaches us this? Parents, right? Parents, absolutely. Who else? Friends, other people. How about social media? Social media I'm addicted to, right? I think we could all say that. We're addicted to social media a little bit, right? But that can absolutely teach us some stereotypes at times, right? There's some memes out there that are very stereotypical, right? So what percentage of char characteristics listed discuss are negative? I think all of the ones we talked about, right? They're negative. And why is no one exempt from being stereotyped? Well, I'll tell you. Everyone has something to say, right? Everyone has a Facebook here, right? You log on Facebook early morning, someone got something to say, right? Everyone got something to say. So no one is exempt from these stereotypes, no matter who you are. And what can we do to diffuse or discourage stereotyping? That's why I try to teach our children, right? Our students, our supervisors, our troopers, our police officers, right? Our school board members, things of that nature. When you hear someone putting someone in a stereotype, what do we do? What are we supposed to do? What's the right thing to do? You're, you're going to get a gold star tonight, brother. Educate, right? Do exactly what we're talking about tonight, right? Educate that person on why that's a stereotypical phrase or statement that they just made. Give me one, brother. Say it again. Protest. I like it, right? I like it, which is one of the big things nowadays, right? Absolutely legal to protest peacefully, right? I love it. Next. When we talk about unconscious bias, it's one of my favorite things to teach about. We actually have an implicit bias training that I think is so useful for everyone. So unconscious bias is an assumption, belief, or prejudice about a category of people and determines how we treat them and or interact with them. The concept of unconscious bias applies to all of us. Our unconscious 
perceptions dictate many of the most decisions that we make and have a profound effect on the lives of so many people in so many ways. Next. So unconscious bias is the result of messages that we receive in an early age. Just a little story of mine. At 16 years old, or even prior to that, I grew up in a very biased uh, and stereotypical, I guess, uh, household. My mom and dad raised me to not like law enforcement. I hated cops. Okay? I hated cops as a kid. I can't even believe I'm standing up here uh, as a trooper because it's literally a miracle. Uh, and at 16 years old, I watched the Pennsylvania State Police, who I now work for, kick in our front door, raid our house, and ultimately take my dad away, which helped my bias even more. I hated cops even more because they just broke up a happy, what I thought was a happy home. So I hated cops even more, hated the cops. I thought they were all you know, racist. They break up homes. Uh, they do all just terrible things, right? And that was my bias. I remember my dad, at times, when we would drive past a cop, he would say, you know, racial slurs, white cop, and this and that, right? Which, as a kid, I hear that, and I think that's the right thing to do. So my dad went away, and I was a knucklehead kid back home, and it wasn't until a phenomenal police officer who was in my neighborhood, white gentleman, kind of took me under my wing, under his wing, saw that I was having some issues, and really showed me what a phenomenal police officer what phenomenal police officers do in the community. And that's what really changed the bias that I had. It changed everything because that positive interaction, the, the positive statements he would give me, the stuff that he would show me really changed everything for me. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to become a Pennsylvania State Trooper. So these biases have a huge, huge, huge part within our lives, especially if they're negative, okay? So, the messages come from a variety of sources, such as families, right? Friends and media. The earlier messages become prejudices that are deeply held in our unconscious and influence how we act towards one another, like we talked about. Research indicates that many of the prejudices exist beyond our conscious awareness and a result of being brought up in a culture that harbors biases, like we just talked about. The first step to reducing unconscious bias in the workplace, school, law enforcement department, anything is to recognize our own biases, right? And we all have them. If you are sitting here tonight and you think you don't have biases, you're lying to yourself. Simple as that, okay? We all have biases. It's just important that we check ourselves and check on the biases that we hold, right? So we don't have a negative impact on who we deal with on an everyday basis. Next. So with this being said, we're going to kind of tap into some of our biases, right? And uh, this is a beautiful introspective quiz that we're going to take tonight. Who would have thought you have a quiz tonight? But with that being said, I'm going to give you a series of words that are on the screen. And I want you to automatically give me the age, sex, race, and features of these individuals. I want you to paint a picture in your head of what these individuals look like. And you're going to kind of tap in to your own biases, maybe. We're going to go through this fairly fast, but I want you to kind of think of the age, sex, race features. So judge, give me some. No, not yet. Go through them. We'll talk about them here in a minute. Just kind of tap every couple seconds. Don't, don't, don't disrespect me on that one. Physicians. Conservative. Liberal. Trailer park. Thug. So I want you to think about your responses. Okay? Think about your responses. So I want you to go to law to police officer. Go back to police officer if you can. And please don't disrespect me on this one. But I want you to paint the picture of what does that look like to you? What's the age, sex, race, and some features of a police officer that you just painted in your head? Sorry, right, you could talk about a cop when a cop is teaching. It's okay. Male, 30, white, and type, a type A personality. Good, good. Little man. Okay. What's he act like? Um, I just like sometimes find myself 
Okay, I like it. Now we're getting into it, right? Stuck up. How else? It's okay. You're, you're right, right? But where did he get that from? Where did he get that? Where did he get the term stuck up? Right? TV. Maybe a police officer. He saw a police officer do something that may have been stuck up, right? Um, give me something else. Give me yours. Okay. Okay. You can say it. It's okay. Good. Good. Uh, sir, give me something. I was thinking young, assertive. Okay. Um, yeah, that's okay. Mine is uh, older, in his 40s or 50s. Um, male, white. Uh, some features. He is a, a, a big stomach, right? His gun belt is hanging off of his hip, right? He's very mean and aggressive, right? Uh, has the hair like bald here, but all around here, right? But how do I get that bias? How do I get that picture of what a police officer looks like? Yeah, it's the cops who used to chase me around as a kid, right? TV, absolutely, right? Uh, and I always say, you know, every time I put this uniform on, whether it's a suit, whether it's a, you know, police uniform, I try to change that bias, right, of people. I try to have positive interactions, right? I try to, you know, as soon as that young man came in the room, I'm like, I'm on him, right? Because I want to try to change his thought process. I want him, the next time he sees this, he says, you know what, maybe African American, maybe white, but he's cool as heck, talked to me as soon as I, I came in the room, right, showed interest in me, built with me. Because that's what we want to try to do to bridge that gap. Go to uh, Trailer Park. Somebody lives in a trailer park. Give me their age, sex, race, and features. Give me. I'm going to start picking on people now. Give me something. Okay. That's okay. Male and female, what are the features? How do they act? What do they do on a daily basis? Rough? Okay, I like it. What else? There you go, right, yeah. Okay, all right. Sorry, give me something. Okay, there you go. That's what I want. Okay. There you go, good, I like it. Uh, my, my bias, uh, white male, like 19 to 30, jeans, dirty jeans, wife beater, bush light, um, drunk, and just beat up his wife. How did I get that bias? How did I get it? Yeah, right? So you see how these biases may really have an impact on us, right? Troopers may go to those calls all the time, and maybe the, the first time, it already puts a bias. And that next time they go to that trailer park, they're already assuming what? Guy got a bush light in his hand, but we all know there's some trailer parks out there, million-dollar trailer parks, right? So we don't want to have these biases have a negative impact. Go to Thug. This will be the last one. Give me it. Age, race, sex, features. Under 25, okay. Male. Good, good. Black and Hispanic, good. Give me some features. Angry, Angry. there you go, good. Uh, just to save on time, uh, mine is, you know, 18 to 34, right? Uh, black male, tattoos everywhere, right? Maybe a little bit cocky, right? Arrogant, um, loud, right? Uh, scary looking, right? And who did I just, who, who did I just describe? Go ahead. Yeah, me, right? Me. There's times when you don't see me like this that a lot of people categories, categorize me as this, right? And we'll talk about the look here in a minute, but there's times where I wear a tank top, some basketball shorts, some flip-flops, I go to Nordstrom's, right? 
go to the, you know, very prestigious places because I like nice things as well, right? And as soon as I walk in, they see my tattoos, they see how big I am, right? They see I may not be smiling all the time, right? And they categorize me as this, not knowing, you know, when they're following me around in the store because they think I'm going to what? Steal, right? And not knowing that who, if something happens in that store, who's going to take care of it? Me, the state trooper, right? The state trooper. But it, the biases failed them, right? Failed them. So let's not always think about uh, our biases and obviously, uh, you know, don't, don't ever judge, judge a book by its cover. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Next. So implicit bias defined. Like we talked about before, implicit bias refers to our attitudes, stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and things of that nature. These biases, which encompass both favorable and unfavorable assessments, are activated involuntarily and uh, without the individual's awareness at times. Next. So expanding on it, these biases often arise, results trying to find patterns and navigate an overwhelming stimuli in this very complicated world. Next. Culture, media, friends, family, things of that nature is how we actually learn these things. Next. So navigating stimuli. It happens within our brain. We have system one, which is one side of our brain. System two is the other side. When we talk about our systems of thinking, system one is that fast, automatic, frequent, many times emotional, very, very, many times stereotypic. Then we have system two, slow, effortful, logical, calculated, conscious, and infrequent. I always try to tell people it's, it's, it's important that we try to utilize our system two side of the brain, uh, especially when it comes to our biases, right? Next. Next. So system one examples. Our introspective exam, right? When I said thug, you already had a picture. When I said police officer, already had a picture, right? Then driving home from work. If I told you, sir, drive home from work right now, you're not going to put it on the GPS, right? You just know. You've done it so many times, right? It's frequent. System two examples. Typing a complaint, typing a report. You're utilizing your logical side of things, right? It's a little bit slower, effortful, right? And you better believe when I was following the directions here, I did not want to make a wrong turn, right? So I was using system two of my brain, right? When I was listening to GPS, usually like loud rap music, that's, that's kind of what my, my, my style, right? Please believe I wasn't listening to loud rap music, right? I was slow, effortful. I did not want to make a wrong turn. I was utilizing System two, all right? Next. So implicit bias expanded. There are many different examples of implicit bias. Next. Where can we find this? You're going to start seeing that you're going to be looking at many different areas to find these biases. And I'm, we're going to talk about it here in a minute of where we find these things. Next. So where can we find them? All the way through, please. Lending practices, advertising, hiring practices, news reporting, crime reporting, and ultimately policing. Next. Check this out, please. Anthony Proctor says he was thrilled when he received a mortgage to buy a home. But when he moved in, he learned his bank had charged him an interest rate almost three times that of his neighbors. He says simply because he was African American. Every time I talked to him on the telephone, they would ask for my nationality. If you qualify and you're Afro-American, they gave you a higher rate. It's a charge customers have been making for years against some of America's largest banks. On Thursday, the U.S. Justice Department announced it had reached a settlement with one of those lenders, Wells Fargo. This is a case about real people. African American and Latino who suffered real harm as a result of Wells Fargo's discriminatory lending practices. The settlement is a result of a three-year investigation that revealed between 2004 and 2009 some of Wells Fargo's mortgage brokers steered minority borrowers into more expensive loans. But the $175 million settlement is tiny in comparison to the $4.2 billion that Wells Fargo says it earned in net income 
in just the first quarter of this year. It's not the first time the U.S. Justice Department has settled with one of America's big banks. Last December, a settlement was reached with Bank of America for more than $330 million, again, over allegations of discriminatory lending. In both cases, though, as part of the settlement, the mortgage lenders have admitted to no wrongdoing, which upsets Anthony Proctor. How can you get away with that? How can you sit back and admit no wrongdoing? Still, as America's biggest lender, Wells Fargo will continue to manage more than a third of the country's mortgages. And despite this multi-million dollar settlement, it's denied the discrimination claim. How would you feel? It's the American dream, right? Being able to buy property, buy your home, your dream home. Uh, I'm a big real estate investor back home in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, you better believe that every single time I buy a property, what am I looking at? I'm looking at that fine print, right? I'm looking at those interest rates, right? Um, but it happens, okay? Many banks have been caught doing it, and it's not right. You know, I would, I would, I would feel crushed that I was getting a higher interest rate just because of what I looked like, okay? Next. So advertising. Who likes cereal? I love cereal, right? Who likes Pops? Remember Pops, the cereal? Yeah, you like those? Okay. I want you to... I want you guys to, uh, well, not yet, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> I wanted you guys to pick out the bias within this POPs advertisement. And obviously, we, we just gave you it, but you'll see, you'll start seeing that different advertisements have different biases within them. This one, uh, having the janitor be a little bit of a darker POP, right? That may be basic, right? A lot of people say, ah, oh, you know, you're being a little bit too... Um, too stressed about certain things, but why? Why did they do that? Go to the next one. This one's a little bit more, uh, stands out a little bit more, okay? So what are they trying to put out here? What are they trying to do? Yeah, right? So they're trying to implement that African-American household has an absent father, right? When we know that's not true. Uh, at times it is, and at times it is for any race. Uh, but we have over on the right, we have the Brady Bunch. And then over on the left, they're trying to implement that, you know, absent father, African-American household, no dad. Next. So hiring practices. Check this out. Imagine if you were applying for a job and before you could even get an interview, you were turned away because of your name. A Chesterfield company sent an email to a St. Louis County woman that told her her name was too ghetto to work for them. Our Casey Nolan spoke to the woman and has been looking into the company side of the story. Mike and Ann, this did not take too long to just blow up online. A lot, thousands of people, in fact, have shared this woman's post here about an email she received from a company that said her name, Hermesha, is just too ghetto for them to consider. I was devastated when, when I just opened the, the email. I was expecting that from a job. As if job applications aren't stressful enough, Hermesha Robinson says she's often worried about the line at the top. Uh, it's just unique. It's for my mom and my father. A combination of Herman and Misha, Hermesha's fears seem to be confirmed when she opened this email Monday, what looked like a rejection letter for a customer service position. When I read the email, I was just appalled of what, like, I don't understand why would they not consider me just because of my name. The email was from a company in Chesterfield with a name that seems to be a mashup of two words, Mentality. It thanked Hermesha for her interest but said, quote, unfortunately, we do not consider candidates that have suggestive ghetto names. We all equal, we all the same. We should be treated the same as everyone else. It shouldn't matter about anything else. Based on our qualifications. Right, especially when you're applying for a job and you have a well-qualified resume sitting right in front of you. The company tells Five on Your Side they were hacked. They suspect a disgruntled former employee who sent the message to Hermesha and at least one other applicant. Although she can't unsee that, I wish she could, the owner told us. But even if that's the case, someone wrote it, and Hermesha and her cousin aren't surprised. Do you think this happens more than people realize? Oh, definitely. I think this happens all the time. A lot of people I know don't want to put their real name on the application because, of, uh, because it says who they are. 
and they stereotype people names uh, and disqualify them from jobs based on that. Nothing else, just the name. I talked to Chesterfield Police. They tell me the company has reached out to them. They have filed a police report and Chesterfield detectives are looking into this hack. The company thinks it came from somewhere out of state, but they won't say where just yet. Chesterfield trying to track it down. Mike and Ann. I mean, Casey, so many people have unusual names. Kim Kardashian named her child North. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a shame that she became a target because of her name. Well, and the thing that really bothered her cousin, Mike, was that she said Hermesha thought maybe she should change her name just to try to fit in and, in her words, be more basic. That really upset her. And again, it comes it's a family uh, origin this name comes from, so that she didn't like at all. Next. All right, Casey, thanks. Ma'am, you said you had a Ph.D., correct? How would you feel? How would you feel if you went all that time within your school history, right? You got your PhD and you put in for a job opportunity that you believe you are more than qualified and they hit you with that email saying your name was too ghetto, didn't even give you a chance. How would you feel? Yeah, it's, 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 it's absolutely off. It's unacceptable, but it happens. It absolutely happens. Many establishments have been uh, caught doing this. You know, just because of somebody has an ethnic name, uh, which a lot of people don't even understand that, you know, a lot of ethnic names, they, they, they have a meaning to them. It's just not a bunch of, uh, you know, letters scrambled together. It's actually meaning to these things. So next. So are Emily and Greg more employable than Lakeisha and Jamal? Well, when it comes to uh, research, next. Yes, they are, okay. The National Bureau of Economic and Research and Study says white names receive 50% more callbacks for interviews than black names with similar resumes. It doesn't matter if the individuals were federal contractors, doesn't matter if the establishments were equal opportunity employers, uh, they still were found discriminating because of those ethnic names. Next. So news reporting. So in this incident, there was a burglary that happened. Um, Iowa newspaper, the Gazette posted two stories about local burglaries. Both stories were written by the same author and published within one day of each other. Okay? Uh, one story used yearbook photos, and the other stories utilized mug shots of those individuals. So think about it. The top guys, if, before you even go back, please. Before you even read the story and you see the individuals at the top with their mug shots, guilty or not guilty? What do you think? Guilty all day long, right? Individuals down below, the white gentleman, yearbook photos, uh, just a slap on the wrist, right? Next. So when, when we talk about policing and crime reporting, I would be doing you all a disservice if I uh, said that, you know, all of these entities within policing and, you know, police departments, you know, they weren't doing anything wrong. We all have issues, right? Every entity within your, our workplace has issues, and law enforcement uh, is one of them. So the Pennsylvania State Police, we, I like to share this because uh, it's transparency, especially within our community. So a PA State Police was warned about possible racial virus in car searches. The agency's answers, we end the research. Next. So in 2002, after scandals in New Jersey, over racial profiling by state troopers, the Pennsylvania State Police began collecting data from its hundreds of thousands traffic stops each year and sending it to the University of Cincinnati for analysis. The findings contained over 2,000 pages of research and produced it to the university. It indicated that there was no consistent evidence over the study period that troopers stopped drivers, issued citations, and or made arrests based on race, which is phenomenal. That's what we want. We want individuals, uh, we, we do not want to show any sort of uh, bias when we do in that, right? But they did reveal a persistent problem after stops had occurred. Year after year, according to reports, troopers were roughly two to three more times likely to search black and Hispanic drivers than white drivers. And at the same time, the research found that troopers were far less likely to find contraband on black and Hispanic drivers compared to white drivers. And I say that to say, we all have issues. This is wrong. And we shouldn't have stopped the research, and we 
have implemented other things now to track these things and to get better. And that's what we ultimately want to do when we show these type of biases, to get better. And we are doing that as a department. Next. So the impact of implicit bias. Before we start this, I want you to kind of think about your own journey. When you interact with people, especially the ones you don't know, you know, do you judge them off just what they look like? And we're going to talk about the look and how impactful that is. The look is something that everyone gets. And a lot of people, when they teach diversity and inclusion, they talk about the look when it comes from white people to black people. And I don't like to teach it that way. I believe everyone gives that look. Now, I teach and I also coach um, boxing. And I'm a boxing coach at Third Avenue Boxing Gym in the inner city of Pittsburgh. They have a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal program for inner city youth. We have kids from six years old to 18 years old. We have three national champions, okay? And trust me, if I brought you into our gym, sir, all of my kids, with most, mostly minorities, are gonna look at you and look at me like I'm crazy. Like, who is this white guy, right? Why the hell are you bringing him <laughs> to our gym, right? But we all get that look, me. Once again, I get that look where? Nordstrom's, right? Especially when I have my cutoff shirts on, my tattoos out, I get the look. It hurts. It absolutely hurts. And I want you to kind of self-reflect and think about if you ever got the look or if you ever gave the look. Check this out. So again, it's important for us to talk about this stuff, right? We've all given it. We've all probably received it. Again, perfect example, my boxing team, right? Kids that I love to death, right? Phenomenal, phenomenal program we run in the inner city of Pittsburgh, Third Avenue Boxing Gym. If I would bring anybody that may not be uh, African American, my kids are going to probably look at you a little weird, right? Same thing when I have full uniform and I walk into Chick-fil-A for a milkshake. Everyone's looking at me, giving me that look, like, what's he doing, right? Who's he here to arrest? I'm just here for a milkshake, <laughs> right? Uh, same thing when I go into Nordstrom's, all tatted up. A lot of people looking at me, giving me the look. Uh, just recently, I was in the um, inner city of Greensburg, where I'm born and raised. Tattoos out, and uh, I was walking down the street, uh, headed to the courthouse, and I had an older lady, a uh, white lady, had her purse on this side, and when she saw me coming, gave me a little bit of a look, and then did this, took the purse from one side to another. That hurts, right? What's she think I'm gonna do, steal her purse, right? But who's, she, who, who, who's the one that's gonna be calling upon me for something that she needs maybe, you know, as a first responder? So uh, it's important that we understand that it hurts and kind of do a little bit of self-reflection when we talk about the look. So over overcoming implicit bias, it's one of the most important things, that's why we're here today. Next all the way through. So awareness, 
We want to be aware of it. Implicit bias does exist. Go back, please. Back. Back. So awareness. Being aware of implicit bias, making sure that we understand that it does exist. And we want to ask ourselves, you know, are we dealing with this person and acting based upon our subconscious bias? Or am I acting based upon the person's actual behavior or facts of the situation? That's what we try to teach our law enforcement officers. You better not be acting upon what someone looks like. You better have cold, hard facts and probable cause in understanding the person's actual behavior on how you're dealing with, how you're dealing with them. Not because they may be black or white or Chinese or Hispanic, things of that nature. Next. So positive interactions, which I believe is wholeheartedly going to change everything, right? When it comes to biases, stereotypes, having those positive interactions. And when I teach young troopers or young police officers, this goes a long way. You know, my interaction with this uh, young man here when he first got here, I don't know what his interaction with law enforcement has been in the past, but I could bet 100% today he thinks a little bit more positively about law enforcement. As soon as he walked in, he had his head down and I almost tackled him, right? Because I wanted to have a positive interaction with him. I don't know him from anybody, but we were able to talk. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know I was a police officer. And it's important that we have these positive interactions because it literally uh, dissipates any sort of racial anxiety that we may have between one another and or just the stereotyping. They may dissipate by having these positive interactions. Now, I tell this story all the time. Uh, because we are very, very cognizant on how we deal with underserved communities. And when we go into these communities and try to have these positive interactions, we're very uh, understanding of how the uniform may just make people feel a little bit more uncomfortable, right? Especially if I came here tonight with a full uniform, my big hat on, people may be a little bit more standoff. It's just a lot easier to talk to me like this than maybe a police uniform. So remember my boxing team that I, I, I'm very proud of? Uh, you know, those kids don't oftentimes have good positive interactions with law enforcement. So when I started coaching down there, uh, I wanted to have that positive interaction with them, but I wanted them to be also understanding with who I am first. So when I first started going there, I was going there in a hoodie, you know, sweatpants, tank top. They were showing, you know, seeing my tattoos, seeing that I was a person, right? And I was building with them for almost three weeks never told them what I did, right? Because the coach already told me, hey, they, you know, they've had some you know, runs, run-ins with police and you know, they, you know, mom and dad may have been arrested, this and that, right? Which we all understand. And then the third, fourth week, I showed up full uniform, full uniform, big hat, everything. And those kids were like, oh my goodness, you're a cop? You're a cop? I'm like, yeah, I'm a cop. That's what I do for a living, right? They thought I was a teacher. They thought I was a principal. They thought I was a lawyer prior, right? I'm a police officer. I'm a Pennsylvania State Trooper. But I made sure that I built that relationship first. I broke down barriers, right? And especially I broke down those barriers and changed those biases when they saw that I was a law enforcement officer after I already built that positive and good relationship. So this has huge, huge, huge weight when it comes to changing lives and changing what we're all talking about tonight. Next. And then also understanding, you know, perception, right? What do you perceive? Some people see a six, other people see nine. So understanding everyone's perspective on things. Assume everyone's perspective, right? Ask yourself, what is your perspective might be? And if you were in the other person's situation, how would you act? Only then can you develop a better appreciation for what their concerns may be, right? And that goes for law enforcement, that goes for teachers and administrative staff. Uh, you know, school districts, anything. Next. And strategies to overcome implicit bias, strategies to overcoming stereotypes, things of that nature. I always say, treat people the way you would like to be treated or would like to see your family member treated. When I teach young law enforcement officers, I'm like, that's someone's mom, that's someone's dad, someone's sister, brother. You know, make sure that you treat them as if, you know, you guys are almost family or you would like your mom to be treated. Be fair, be respectful, be compassionate, right? Empathy goes a long way, especially when we're trying to overcome these things. Next. With that being said, uh, that's my presentation. Uh, again, hopefully you got something out of it. 
Hopefully it kind of made you think a little bit. Um, but I'm here for any type of questions.